All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Brain Club. Um, I'm Mel Hauser. I use she, they pronouns, and I'm the executive director of All Brains Belong. And welcome, welcome to Brain Club. For those of you uh, who are returning, welcome back. For those of you who are new to Brain Club, welcome. Today, we're going to be talking about reimagining work and hearing from members of our community um, about what what that has been like. Before we begin, just to name, uh, closed captioning is enabled. You just have to toggle it on if you'd like to use it. Depending on your version of Zoom, you might see the live transcript closed captioning icon. If not, look for the more dot 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 and choose show subtitles. Um, you can also do the same and choose hide subtitles if you want to turn them off. So uh, particularly if you're new to Brain Club, what's Brain Club? So Brain Club is All Brains Belongs uh, Community Education Program where we cover a wide variety of topics related to neurodiversity and neuroinclusive culture. Um, our main purpose is to demonstrate, um, you know, uh, our approach to neuroinclusive culture and also um, in uh, addressing topics of concern um, to folks in our community um, and inviting community members, both uh, who are part of the Operations Belong community and those who are not yet, um, to 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 reflect on these things and really build these relationships and develop these bridges between between people and ideas. And uh, participation in Brain Club, just as any All Brains Belong program, um, involves a community agreement um, that was created by our community advisory board. Um, there is no one right way to participate. You can have your video on or off. Even if it's on, we don't expect anything of you. Please feel free to you know move. Fidget, stims, eat, whatever, whatever needs doing. Um, and there will be portions of tonight where we'll have open discussion and questions. And when it gets to those parts, you can do so with mouth words or in the chat. Um, and observation is a valid form of participation. And uh, in addition to affirming all aspects of identity, uh, one of the things that we do to create um, really a, 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 the level of safety um, that is, is, is important to this community that is different than many, many other public spaces is that we really prioritize um, the, the collective. This is a program oriented around the collective community coming together. Um, we, we, we hope that your brain club experience feels safe and supportive, um, but we do need to know, note that um, this is not a support group. It's not, a, not for medical or mental health advice. Um, it's not the right place to make personal requests or address personalized needs. Um, it's, it's a place where we invite you to listen, to learn, to observe what a neuroinclusive space um, uh, can look like. And to think about uh, how, the, how the topics that come up tonight um, maybe, maybe connect with your life. Um, that's my window to make sure I have the chat open. Great, the chat's open. Feel free to use it um, uh, for portions of tonight. Uh, so a couple of weeks ago, we launched a new format of Brain Club based on community feedback. So um, in our 45 minute program, um, I'm going to briefly introduce the topic. And then our panel has been pre-recorded and we'll watch it in two halves. Um, we will watch part one. Of the, of the panel presentation, and then we'll pause for questions and discussion. And then we'll watch the second half, and then we will pause again for questions and discussion. And out of respect to the panelists, the chat will be disabled during the presentation. Um, Lizzie's gonna put some ideas in the, in the chat um, for um, uh, things to consider having available to you during Brain Club and some ideas for what to do while the chat is closed. Uh, because for, for, for many of us, uh, the chat is like a cognitive fidget, um, helps you focus, help, helps you process. So here are some, uh, Lizzie's gonna post some ideas about um, you know things you can do instead while the chat is turned off. All right, so we are continuing our October, 2024 theme of inclusive community. Um, so uh, we talk about Brain Club, I'm sorry, we have Brain Club, we have Brain Club, Every month we talk about employment. Um, it's usually the third week of the month. We always talk about employment because employment is a really big deal, um, a really big concern to the neurodivergent community. Um, autistic adults, uh, depending on what, what you read, um, have you know anywhere from two and a half to eight times uh, increased likelihood to be unemployed or underemployed. 75% of ADHDers experience employment related challenges. And what we know is that employment and health are bi-directionally related. All too often society haters like to one lane, this is the way you do the thing. 
Anyone whose brain works differently than that is far more likely to be othered and far more likely to have difficulty accessing resources. What we don't want, we don't want the square peg being hammered to fit into the round hole. It's what happens. You break the peg. And all too often, that's what happens in the workplace, in a one-size-fits-all world. When we think about access needs, and when I use that term, I mean anything that someone needs for full and meaningful participation, there are so many different types of access needs that play out at work. And um, uh, Lizzie's going to drop a link um, to some uh, resources in the chat. Um, we've got a lot of blog posts and stuff, um, all, all uh, ex going into detail about different types of access needs at work. Um, but tonight, um, we're going to be talking about relationship to work. Um, and of course, when we think about all of the different ways in which human beings are othered in this society, you know, othered for race, gender, sexuality, class, you know, ev like so many, so many things. Um, and, and often this has a compounded um, negative impact on a person's ability to access um, what they need. And we have so many community members who struggle to access basic needs. And when you struggle to access basic needs because you are thwarted by all of the broken systems, um, not surprisingly, we have folks who struggle with employment who then can't access basic needs that might help them access other resources. And we are just chasing our tail or it can feel that way. And sometimes we don't talk about these things. And when we think about the way that all of the oppressive power systems are all integrated, you know, white supremacy culture, ableism, capitalism, like all of the systems that aren't working for a lot of people. Um, we have a lot of people in our community who are left out and who are unable to access even basic needs so we can't talk about relationship with work without talking about all of those things. And um, the, the, the one thing I, I want to name before we watch our panel is that we can't talk about relationship with work without talking about class. And so Kessel and Burkefield in a book that we love here at Brain Club and talk about all the time, Parenting for Social Justice, um, define class as um, uh, a, a, a relative social hierarchical ranking. Um, that carries with it cultural knowledge, skills, networks, and of course, um, you know, the, the intersectional impact of uh, not having access to the resources that you need and being thwarted for all of the other aspects um, that you're trying to do and being discriminated and othered for all kinds of aspects of identity. Um, so, of course, these things will impact um, one's access to resources, one's relationship to work, whether you're respected, whether you belong, whether you have any decision-making power in any given situation. Um, uh, Davy Schlasko and Toby Kramer um, from Think Again um, uh, have, have put forth some reflective questions about relationship to work. Why do we work? How do we how, how we feel or think we should feel about our work? The relationship to, between paid work versus other parts, other kinds of work. Um, maybe even an emotional relationship to the economic system. You know, and by economic system, I mean capitalism, which uh, works differently for different people. And depending on um, how capitalism works for a person, they may have a different emotional relationship to the economic system. And so much of this has been modeled throughout our lives, even in early childhood. And then, of course, um, the intersectional um, uh, compounding uh, uh, aspects of uh, being discriminated and prevented and denied from living your best life for all these different reasons. They all compound. So we're going to watch our panel where uh, folks are talking about some of these things. So big thank you to Connie Beal, Jason Capobianco, Sarah Knutson, Sheila Linton, Teo Rodas and Summer Stalter. And I never remember to do the motor plan correctly where I sh actually share the, uh, the sound. So I'm gonna do that. And here we go. Oh, did I not have my slide? Where's my slide where I show you our, our plan for the day? Oh, it's the next slide. Hold on, I'm gonna show you that first.
So we're going to watch watch our part one of our panel. We're going to pause for questions and comments. We're going to watch the rest, and then we're going to have more time for discussions and questions. So as while you listen or watch, um, just an optional prompt for consideration about your relationship with work and, and maybe where did that come from? All right, now for real, I'm going to play the video. Except I don't remember whether I clicked the sound button. No, I really didn't. Brain. Okay, here you go. I really think we need to reimagine work. The system tells you that your value comes from what you produce, which is, of course, bogus. You know, the more productive you are, the whatever. And, like, the idea of, like, work, work mm -hmm. has become so removed from, I don't know, meaning, purpose, identity. And, like, it doesn't need to be those things. But for some people, yeah. it is those things. And there's this, you know, tension. So, I don't know, for, for you, um, I'd love to know how do you personally define the concept of work. It's interesting because my definition of work has changed. So I started working when I was 17 at a answering service. And from there, um, I loved it. I loved talking to people. I liked that I wasn't in front of them. Um, I enjoyed that part. And I, from there, went into a sales position. Um, and I really, I liked that it was a little bit harder to like deal with people, but I found that I was really good with computers. I had already taken some computer classes in school, so I really got into into technology. People are like on this like this path of like this is your menu of options in your life, and like you pick one of them. Anyway, in an ideal world, how do you enter the workforce? Hmm. Entering the workforce, there is to an extent a leap. You have to start somewhere. So the company that I worked for, they sold cell phones. So I had my first cell phone um, while I was working there. And I, I did stay in sales for a little while. I even sold cars. Um, but it was hard having that face-to-face. -face. And I was really horrible at breaking the ice. But it was very challenging for me to like talk about interesting things i guess for people and then i would i would hyper like think about that and then it would make me even more isolated <laughs> and you're in that plot process of exploring and reflecting so finding something that feels like it matches your identity your needs your values but accepting that there will be a level of compromise i mean work is work people work ideally not just for the paycheck but part of it is because there's a paycheck my upbringing, my father was a, a sales uh, rep, and he worked really, really hard. He didn't have a high school diploma, and he was like a hero to me because he worked so hard for our family, um, and it wasn't easy because he, I could see the struggle that he had. And my mother was always like, um, maybe not quite an executive assistant, but pretty close to that, and she had really good work ethic. Um, that's what I thought I was supposed to do. You know, I thought that I was supposed to find this job and that I would just be really good at it and, you know, it would be amazing. It was hard. As kitchens tend to attract multiply marginalized people, because I've been in a lot of kitchens with other trans folks, with other neurodivergent folks, where it's like, okay, so these expectations are built around cis bodies and a one neurotype um and my body actually can't <laughs> be here yeah. for 12 hours <laughs> um otherwise i start having heart palpitations <laughs> healthy employment relationship is like all relationships families friends romantic it, it should be bi-directional you should be putting something in but also getting something back so as you're exploring different types of work and ways to integrate into the workforce be careful to not only be assessing yourself, but be assessing the, the context and how you perform in that context and also what those employers offer um, and, and how they create fit as well. It's, it's, there's two sides to that. And often it's all too easy to go internal and take all the responsibility. It worked or didn't work because of me, but that's not really how it is. And then, and then you add on top of that, the personal life stressors um, that, that um, can come up and any of those things, uh, one can have difficulty, I can have difficulty managing, become dysregulated, 
Um, the hyperfocus means that I tend to get and stay distracted from work. Those are all stressors. And then once I get like any of those stressors, you know, that, that can start to lead that, that it goes unresolved can lead to, it really gets me into a, a, a vicious cycle of a, a dysregulation spiral. So I get, I get stressed out, I get anxious, um, that, which leads to mental and physical tension. I go into defensive behaviors, worry, self-protective avoidance, distraction. Um, there's dysregulation, including sleep, which leads to less capacity for attention, less capacity for motor skills and motor planning, less executive functioning, which then can lead to more and bigger mistakes, um, hyper-focus, getting stuck on the wrong details, self-justification, and externalizing blame, attacking perceived sources of threat all of which go over really well in a work environment, leading to more fit, more negative feedback, possible discipline, job loss, bad reviews that limit my potential to advance and my potential for access to organizational power and privilege that could actually help me fix the problems that are affecting me. The idea of shifting social norms through community connection with this vision of like, what what like can i rethink some things in my life that aren't working for me or maybe are working for me and can i learn about my access needs in that way it was really hard for me to get into that social place of like knowing how to interact with people in the office and then also how to break away and do my job if i was having trouble i'm very good with routine so you know you give me a spreadsheet or a word document like i know how to write a letter i'm very good with um grammar but if it was out of that wheelhouse that would be a lot more challenging for me and, and that's when i started to notice a lot more i mean i had already noticed differences growing up but i didn't really like what i was doing when we think about work in terms of like meaningful occupation often like the meaningfulness of that is kind of left out i think the most important thing is to build that framework of assessing and reflecting i think i like these things i think these are important characteristics i think this is my identity and then exploring it and reflecting on how you responded but not holding yourself to a very specific definition of who you are or what your identity is or what's important because that will change over time so it's more about having that framework to explore it than it is to identify yourself and it'll continue to change throughout adulthood so it's that it's about having a structure to reflect and assess and explore more so than it is like figuring it out because just as you figure it out we are people and we are dynamic and we change and at a young age, I realized, well, we're working because we have to so that we live this life so that we have cars, we can buy clothes, we can have a house. Because that's all I was thinking. Like, I'm supposed to, you know, make this so much money at whatever age. I'm supposed to have children at this age. And I'm supposed to have a house. Like, there's this timeline that I'm supposed to follow. And it was very challenging for me. And I'd always be like, why? Why do I have to do this? And it's, it, it's not working for me. Like what is supposed to happen isn't happening. And I would tell people, I'm like, we're working because we have to, but if we didn't have to, would we be working? What, how do you define work? What does work mean to you? Like this starts so much earlier than entering the workforce. An important consideration for work that it is often overlooked is how it matches a person's individual values. And that can happen in a lot of ways. You can directly approach a value, like I like helping other people and work in human services. But I think sometimes we, we fall short at expanding that definition. If you like helping people, you can also work in retail or in customer service. Uh, so overlaying what your values are with what the job is, and how it feels and and operates practically so part of that is assessing your values and those will change over time and there's no right and wrong values necessarily so it's there's a level of self-understanding in that exploration and i use exploration intentionally because work can be a way to explore those values or how to tap into them. I think it's very often we talk about like 
like what we do like for work rather than who we are and the gifts we have to offer to our communities so being able to share our gifts sometimes our gifts might be tied to the work that we do but sometimes our gifts are not tied that we could be artists we can be we can be other things in our lives that often don't get to be shared in our workplace or in our communities i think people don't realize that maybe they're really good at doing something right but they don't enjoy it but it's what they do and they're getting money doing this but at the end of the day they're just like that wasn't a fulfilling day i could see really drilling into what are the benefits of workplaces and the benefits of being a worker and who are those benefits for and who are they not for like how are mm -hmm. things by design right now either working or not working um yeah. Where are those gaps in our um, in in the safety nets that support workers or that could support everyone? But I I this is where I start to think about we we talk about benefit cliffs we talk about the uh, sort of the, the it, that increasing space where workers are earning more but not having uh, safety nets that keep pace um, and therefore in 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 a unintended consequence of actually taking people out of work, right? The idea of right. like, we want people to be in the workplace, but if they don't have the supports they need for stability in their housing and stability in their healthcare, they will only work so much where they can't keep working and they will yep. come back out because that's how they get their basic needs met and the resources they rely on. And that's a stuck place for a lot of people who, who would like to be unstuck. Like a lot of people work in areas that tend toward exploitation and dehumanization um and some of those folks are like i'm just doing this until like i make it in a creative field i'm just doing this until i am finished with this certification that's going to let me do this job that i really care about and some people are like i've been forced to do this because of racism because of classism and discrimination and hiring practices so on and so forth and some of us are there because we want to be and because we think that it's important that people do those jobs and that whether you are working a job that tends towards exploitation and dehumanization or you in your day-to-day -day life are profiting from other people working those jobs whether it's buying your coffee at a coffee shop that a barista makes or like going to the grocery store where someone is stocking the shelves um those are jobs that like are inherently like full of dignity like that work matters on a fundamental level and is important and is noble and like even if you want to do it being treated poorly doing those kinds of jobs can really weigh on you and like it's important that you're doing that work whether you continue to do it or not it's you should be proud of it we all all people to an extent want to contribute something and, 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 and offer and help in some way, uh, you might want to find a way to meet that psychological need through your work where you can contribute and, and, and help others. Or you may have robust opportunities outside of work where you don't need to use work to balance that. The idea of like a person growing up over time and this idea of like, more like a holistic transition that starts way earlier of this path, this path to thriving, right? Like, like, can you, can you, can you talk about that? For me, thriving, flourishing is the goal, whether it's at work, personally, honestly, it's, it's about personal flourishing and thriving and how does work contribute to that? And it can do it in different ways. Is it helping you expand your boundaries or push your horizons? Or is it reinforcing a strength and in, in, in some part of your identity and how you self-identify? Does it give you community? Uh, does it expose you to new community? Yeah, I think that's really important because I think a lot of times it's like accidental how your path evolves, like the experiences you have, um, the people you're around, whether it's whether these experiences are are affirming. Like even, I mean, there are people, I mean, let's even think about, you know, transition age youth right like so this idea of you know you make it to middle school and you're like i don't know i don't do i even really know what i like 
do I know what I like? Do I know what I dislike? Do I know what's even important to me? I don't know because there's all these social pressures that say conform, conform. And the bigger picture, the bigger, like the, like this, the, the, the systems that you are in are explicitly training you to conform and comply. And like, that is so counter to this idea of this individualistic thriving, I think. Often I can access. I was a little, little slow on the pause button. All right, let me move this out of the way. We'll open up the chat box and would love to hear what's coming up for folks. Chatter or out loud. About relationship to work. Hi, Michelle, go for it. Hi. Um I just ended a five-year sort of employment situation. I was um, a CCH licensee, which means I cared for a person with intellectual disability in my home. And it was actually a good match for me on a lot of levels where I've had like a whole lifetime of having not good matches. But um, because of the, um, the, the, like the burnout and the sensory overload and the, um, um, like my dad had died and a friend committed suicide like the weekend after we buried my dad. So like that was just an overload. It wasn't just sensory, but it's, you know, like emotional and yeah. everything. And so yeah. I couldn't, I couldn't really care for her appropriately because I had my own stuff that I was dealing with and I had to yeah. give up the license. And, yeah. um, but I did feel like I, you know, like I do want to help people and I wanted to particularly like help people with disabilities. So I thought I had, it was it was a good all around fit for all those things. And now it's come to an end because of these type of limitations that are yeah. inherent in the disabilities. And yeah, yeah. it's ironic that I kind of had to like, I didn't lie about my disabilities and I never hit it, but I also never made them aware of what my limitations were, you know, until right. the end. so it's like, I couldn't really ask for help. And I'm sure that they wouldn't have wanted right. to give me any help, you know, because yeah. if, if yeah. you can't do that job, they don't want you in that job, you know? Yeah. Yeah, Michelle, I, I thank you so much for sharing. And I think, you know, as you as you develop more awareness of your access needs, the things that you need, then then that's what empowers you to have those conversations in. And, you know, if if uh, with the idea of looking for an environment where it's normalized to have these conversations. Thank you for sharing. Sierra. Yeah, yeah. Um I, I really loved what Connie said um, in, I think it was Connie in, in that, in that section of um, that some people will get, you know, some, some people get dopamine and purpose from their work and some people get dopamine and purpose from other things. And, you know, I feel really privileged to have a job that does give me dopamine. And I think it's um, the idea of having a career or a job that is that that's your source of dopamine is such kind of an idolized thing um, and really normalizing that, you can get dopamine from things other than your job. And if you have your access needs met at work, it's easier to do things that get dopamine outside of it. Right. Because I think that so many people, they have all their resources depleted by the time they leave their workplace. I'm going to read a comment from Martha in the chat. I feel thankful that I had a job at a community college that met a lot of my personal needs, even though they did not pay much. They were accommodating to my sensory issues and I enjoyed interacting with the students and the professors. Martha, that's a great story, right? So it's, but it's, it's, it's these, it's these trade-offs. It's all these factors. Like what, what drains my battery? What charges my battery? Thanks for sharing. Sarah. Oh. I just, uh, I guess I'm really intrigued and I don't have any answers, but I I'm intrigued by that overall, like, how do we transform work in our culture? I mean, that sort of larger question. And also, you know, if you have any thoughts on that, Mel, or if ABB has, you know, and, and if other people, but, but, you know, what, what does it take to, tr you know, what are, what would that look like? What would, what would the values be for, for the, around that that we need to have us even as a culture to, to start rethinking work and and um and transforming work in our culture so that 
um, anyway, so that we so so that it it feels like we value like 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 you know this is this is my you know if I'm going can you know at least when I was in the workforce it was like my eight hours of of life this is the you know this is the best energy of my life that's going into this thing I am spending my life doing this thing and the best quality of my energy is going into something. And, and ideally that for me, it feels like that should be something meaningful and purposeful that should have some contribution to the world I want to live in. It should there should be some connection between that and the world I want to live in, not just making a profit for someone who's been enterprising enough to like start their own business. And so um, anyway, those are my thoughts and, and um, would love to hear other people's thoughts. Thank you. What an amazing, what an amazing question, right? And like, I think it, I think it starts with, you know, having conversations like this, um, because it's, it, it, there's so many things that go into, to, to that question. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's one, like, we might be able to recognize the inherent arms of capitalism, and we have to have a method to survive in a system that like you have basic needs that need to get met and this is what's available. Um, so it's like balancing that, but I think that having, having, you know, uh, community conversations on this and, you know, uh, I don't, I don't know that ABB has answers to this. You know, I think that so, some of the ways in which we have community conversations, um, you know, in addition to brain club, is, you know, educating employers about, um, you know, this missing piece of the diversity, equity, and inclusion conversations. Like, lots of times, there's not as much attention given to neurodiversity and access. So just like normalizing, normalizing conversations about human beings have needs. Um, and because uh, it's true. I'm gonna read one more comment, and then I'm gonna go. Thanks, Lizzie. I'm gonna read one more comment, then I'm gonna go back to the second half of the training. Um, oh, there's a couple comments. I'm going to read them and then I'm going to go back to the, I'm going to go back to the uh, second half of the panel. Um, Terry says is a distinction between uh, the work I like and the environment and coworkers. Oh, totally. Right. It's, 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 it's hard. And like, if you have an access made for, um, feeling safe, being safe in an environment that has to, you know, that's the, that's the foundation of the pyramid. Um, and, uh, Liz sharing as a first time attendee, I have a quick nuts and bolts, um, question. Um, yeah, so you can send um, a private chat message um, to to me or to any of the other co-hosts who are our staff. Thanks, Liz. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the second half of the presentation. All right, we might have to watch like one more, like five seconds extra of me. I rewound too far. Bigger system, like the like this, the, the the systems that you are in are explicitly training you to conform and comply, and like that is so counter to this idea of this individualistic thriving. I think often um, there are jobs, roles, positions out there that don't name our gifts, but that we have the offer that would be beneficial to our communities. And so we call that opportunity creation, where we take people's gifts and create opportunity for that, for them to maybe possibly make a living out of that thing and be able to thrive. Tell me, what, is, what does that look like? That sounds incredible. Oh, so I'll give you I'll give you a really great example. And I'll, I'll just I mean, I think I can name names. I don't, I don't think she would mind at all. But I'll, I'll, I'll name the names because I think it's an excellent recent example of opportunity creation, which we have many. So Anna, Anna is a, um, a Latina woman in the state of Vermont who um, when we were trying to do not trying when we were putting together a BIPOC financial wellness empowerment program, she had some expertise uh, in this area. And so we, along with another individual, Shonda, uh, were able to create um, a financial 101, 102, 103 financial wellness series for BIPOC people through the intellectual, through the vision of the root, but the intellectual property of these individuals 
and be able to share that in an affinity space with BIPOC to help um, lift them up in their financial literacy, wellness, awareness, and education. Through that program, we then created another program that was a BIPOC-centered um, home buyers program where we prioritize BIPOC people and their partners to being able to have the information, skills, and resources that they need to buy homes. Because if we know the history of BIPOC people trying to own homes, <laughs> there are still racist policies that are on the books that prevent us from being able to access resources that maybe other people who are, who are not of color can access. So through this, we partnered with Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, one of our local um, affordable housing agencies here in Southern Vermont. And ultimately be through relationship and through those gifts that Anna held, we were able to hire her for this program. And she was able to develop a full program for her own ideas of, of what this looked like uh, through her own trainings, through her own awareness, through her own experiences, and create a curriculum for um, this home buyers um, program with collaboration with the root, with collaboration from Winder and Housing Trust, where we served over 20 BIPOC households in this um, programming. This now has turned into now Anna is employed by Wyndham and Windsor Housing Trust, and she is starting the BIPOC financial empowerment program that is her own gifts that will go that will carry throughout the state providing these um tools and resources and awareness to primarily our BIPOC communities and so not only did she get to share her gifts she got to make connections and relationships and she got got to be paid what she is worth for and valued for who she is and this is just as one example of many opportunity creations that we've been able to create specifically prioritizing BIPOC communities. An incredible story. So you really, it's it, it's like, um, it's no, it's identifying the strengths of individuals within your community and investing in them. Not only are they serving the, like you're investing in them, they are investing in the community and you've created, like together you've created something that didn't exist before. Um, do you have any advice for people who are stuck in a workplace culture because they have also been taught, like you get a job, you do the thing, you know, so you can, do the things right um like right. advice for people who they like they know they need freedom they know they need autonomy but like they they don't imagine they could possibly start their own thing right hope has always been what's driven me and i have always thought that if there was opportunity and you might not have it right now it might not even be tomorrow the job that i had before we started limelight restoration I decided to be a little different with my resume um, and I'm very good with resumes and it was always like, you know, you put wh where you worked and then all the stuff that you did. And I'm like, but I do so much more than that. Like I, I have way more to offer than just office stuff. Right. So on my resume, um, I put that I can run heavy equipment. I can, uh, I drive four wheelers. Like I put all of my, like country girl side on my resume on purpose. It's incorporating so many of my personal interests that I like. So what I have to say with where people are maybe feeling stuck and they're unhappy because they're doing the thing that they think they're good at and that's all they're good at. What do you do when you're not at work? What could you put on your resume? because those are skills. You don't have to have a job that says you can do this. If, if you're a great seamstress or you're good at, you know, marketing stuff and making things, I think that there's a different way of looking at jobs that you may have not thought you were qualified for. If you look at it as an overall picture of what you can provide. When I have gone for interviews in the past, um, when I was younger, it was so intimidating and scary. As I got older, I learned that they're interviewing me for the job, but I'm also interviewing them because I don't know if I want to work here. I've 
been let go before. I have had people not like me stand up for myself. And I didn't want to work for a company where I didn't have a voice because I have a lot to say. And I, you know, I think that people should not be afraid to tell their employer what they need or that they're sick or that they can't come in. It's We're caught in systems that we prop up that we have to, to navigate and cobble together. And we think the system is bigger than us, but the system, but the, that, Really, that it's us. Like we are the ones that have a a, a role in this, and we we can disrupt it. Yes, and I think like you know, like we were talking about this morning with like email, like all the chaos that comes in, right? Like, so you have to you have to be able to have the the spaciousness yes. to zoom out to reimagine, <laughs> and when you're like in the weeds, in the chaos, you can't even do that. So you like stick to the systems because it preserves your bandwidth even though that known quantity is ruining your life right so i don't know what my access needs are necessarily but i'm in situations that either work for me or they don't work for me and when they don't work for me um you know w when someone for example has this frame of, of access I, I, my access needs were not met. It's not like, because because I think sometimes if we don't explicitly name that, that bi-directional relationship, that interaction of environment and person, the idea of this is about a goodness of fit for that person in different environments with different people, people like that, if that frame was not explicitly named for many brains, they don't have it. And so they go, they move through the world thinking that there is, there, they, I mean, they really aren't told explicitly i mean a lot of implicit but explicitly like this is how we do the thing this is how you apply for a job this is how you interview like this is how you show up this is how you sit still in your classroom this is how you line up in kindergarten like it's one way um as opposed to this like the idea we talk a lot about at brain club about the double empathy problem um where you know like it, it's not that there's like one correct way to communicate it's about it's 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 this relationship of first you know this mismatch of perspective taking way of seeing the world communication style and like that's where the breakdowns happen i think it's very important to recognize that it's okay for it not to be the right fit and applies to really everything that that you know so it can apply to work relationships it can you know friendships romantic partnerships it's like it's everything it's it's okay especially because pe as people change over the course of their life they need different things exactly i think it's less about can i do the job did i do the job was i good at the job and more about the fit which is half you and half the context and and how you're supported in it yeah and because a person changes over time organizations change over time too and that like divergence is okay and i think that then like we bring in elements of you know of abandonment and like attachment issues that come into work and and um you know rejection sensitive dysphoria i need to tell my employer that it's time for me to go oh you know like how dare you you know just like all, all this stuff that really then someone goes off into their world and these these experiences i think stay in people's nervous systems and they go into even healthy work environments and they really have trauma physiology i think that if you're looking for a job, if you're in a current job and you're not happy, somehow you need to find your voice, even if you need someone to advocate for you, to step in and say, hey, you know, can you use the language that I need for my employer so they understand what I need? Because people don't need to be getting fired because they're standing up for themselves. I certainly think that there's ways that employers can be sensitive to a variety of stressors and sort of, you know, do this universal design thing, but it still doesn't get away from the power imbalance. There are people who they, they are working, but they're being harmed, like actively harmed at their places of employment. Um, and they, you know, it's like, it's, it's like a, a, a privilege to be able to say like, I'm going to look at what do I want to do with my life? Like the idea of vision casting is like such a higher level brain thing when you're like, in the trenches trying to survive um and and anyway i i really would love to figure out and maybe it's about 
partnering with other organizations. Like All Brains Belong is like a little startup nonprofit. Like we can't hire all of our patients to do stuff and like make enough money to support themselves enough to leave the terrible jobs where they're, you know, um, they're being discriminated against and traumatized all day long. Out of that, but I think it comes with relationships. It's about how can we collaborate? How can we figure out where are the points that we really meet together, right? Where is those intersectionalities that we can support each other? Where are those crossovers? And it's about it's about brainstorming, right? No pun intended, like of like really coming together, having that think tank to come together to see to see more of what's possible. Because exactly what you said is like now we're not paying Anna anymore. Those that money is coming from a variety of other different places. And that's what we can do is we can leverage our relationships and connections with the resources that all of us have when we come together and we're really willing to make that commitment to each other. So I think that's what's most important. What an amazing message. Amy, then Jay, and then we're going to wrap up. We're going we're gonna to a little over tonight. Go for it, Amy. Yeah, I just wanted to say, uh, give my appreciation, um, because I think being a patient, like I, I was thinking about when you said, you know, we can't hire all our patients, but I do think you've created some programs for those of us that have a desire or where can we get dopamine and how do we set up our lives that work for us? And, you know, I've been trying to start my own business supporting folks. And I realized that a lot of my old kind of masking professional um, tendencies come back up of like, of not being able to really be myself in a professional role still. And, and although I've had so much validation in terms of what I want to do, this is like the first time that I'm able to open up as like, does this actually work for me? Like being in this professional role, like even though like my whole life is like being a social worker, whatever, I always had positive feedback, but I've never actually asked like, does this actually work for my nervous system working with people one-on-one? -on -one? Like, how can I create this? And it's, and through the help of like the ABB community, um, and just like different folks that I've become friends with within the community has helped me see like, I've only seen myself as like a helper. And now I'm like opening up as like, oh, I could be a teacher or I could be a writer or I could be like, I didn't have to just like assign this thing that the world told me to be. It's like I can open up to have the thinking. Um, it feels so much more exciting to me to realize that I get to be myself and I get to like do the thing I want to do instead of what the world's told me I should do. Oh, I just want to pause and take that in. So proud of you. Thank you for sharing. Jay. Um, yeah. Thank you for sharing that, Amy. Um, I, um, I, at my last job, um, had a supervisor who did a great job of making the, the the place I worked feel like a safe place to bring feedback. And, um, but she was also someone who communicated with a lot of sarcasm and teasing as a very normal way of um, interacting affectionately with, with um, people she was managing. And I um, eventually realized that that was really hard for my rejection sensitivity. So I sent her an article, which um, Mel, I messaged you if you feel comfortable putting it in the chat. It's an article from Forbes about like, how can managers better support employees with rejection sensitivity? And then I sent her the article and then I at our one-on-one -on -one check in meeting, I said, hey, can we talk about that article I sent you? Because I know that you mean all of these comments with like affection and and it's not negativity, but to me it feels really oh. negative. So can you please adjust? And I'm really, really happy to say that she did. And um, uh, so I would just encourage people to have those conversations if you feel safe having them, because that was a way that I, it was really hard to stand up for myself and say, hey, I know that you're um, not meaning to cause harm, but I, feel hurt when you say something sarcastic that, um, so yeah, so I just wanted to share that that was a success story at my last job that I hope, um, 
I hope people get some strength or some uh, help from that story because um, also I hope that if people are managers that they are willing to take that feedback and work with their employees because it was really, really powerful to see the change in my supervisor's behavior once I sent her that article and had that conversation around like, hey, I know you, you're just teasing, but to me, it feels really bad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Jay, I'm so proud of you. Um, the idea that you would learn about yourself, even learn that rejection sensitive dysphoria is a thing, right? So you learn about it, you learn about yourself. This is real. This is impacting my ability to access these higher order parts of my brain because I don't feel safe. I don't have to pick it. It just happens. Um, and that you are so like, that you're so skillful in how you give that feedback in a way that your supervisor was able to be receptive to. And anyway, thank you for that. What an amazing story to wrap up with. Thank you for sharing. Congratulations. All right, everybody. Well, thank you so much for being part of this conversation. Um, next week, we'll be talking um, about healthcare as community. We've been, as we've been talking about community all month, um, we're going to have the opportunity to watch um, a part of our community health education fair um, with uh, a, a, a number of our community members sharing about their experience of um, coming together with community and experiencing connection and what that has meant for their health. So I hope you'll join us next week. Thanks, everybody. Have a good week. Bye.